you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you gave it to us. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Everything you did, you had us in mind. Thank you, Father, for your great love that you showed to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All that you gave, all that you are, all that you sacrificed for us. How great is your love. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, hallowed be your name. Your name is above all names. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We rejoice in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done in earth. Right here, right now, in this earth. As in heaven. To your glory, your honor, and your praise. And we say together, Amen. And Amen. God is so good. Oh, what a precious spirit of worship and praise. That's awesome. All right. Give the Lord a hand. That's more than budget, y'all. Hallelujah. September $10,885. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God is good. And we just believe that that's going to ever increase. Because we are increased in the things of the Lord in every provision. We are and you are. The house as a corporate body. You as an individual. Praise God. Hallelujah. I tell you, when you begin to believe the Lord and just lay it at His feet, Lord, I know you do anything. Oh, my goodness. Just get ready. Get ready. All right. God is good. Remember the shoe boxes? There is a basket out there to bring things for the shoe boxes. Um, Krista has got a little catalog, too. She's going to be putting out some cards where if you um, don't want to go shopping, don't have time, you can just give them a little check or, or cash for that amount, and that's what they'll purchase to go in the shoe boxes. So praise God. Um, their goal is 50 boxes, and I believe they can meet it. Amen? I think that's awesome that, they're, that they've set that goal for themselves. And the kids set that. That's their, their goal. Praise God. All right. October the 11th, video presentation of Operation Christmas Child will be done. My shoe boxes are sent off in November, the end of November. So, um, But don't wait till the last minute because it takes a lot of time to get them packed and get them packaged and get them ready. And I think every box has to have, is it $7 to pay the price of shipping? So, praise God. We believe everything is met. Right? Our Feed the Hungry workers are needed, so there is a sign-up sheet out there. If you have not taken care of that yet, you might want to remember to sign up. October the 4th is a Feed the Hungry meeting after the service. That's Sunday, October 4th. Okay? Because it has to be planned out. Everything done right and in order. Brother Mike does a great job with that. We appreciate him. All right. Our dates are October 9th and December 4th. We do have um, getting ready for conference, so we will have our work weekend, October 23rd and 24th, for our fall conference on October 31st through November the 2nd. I hope you're already getting excited. We can be excited about Jesus every day. We should be. Amen. But it's exciting at conference time when folks come from all over and there just seems to be such an electricity in the house. Just a greater presence. It's, you know, it's just awesome. November the 9th, the youth will be going to Charlotte to help with shoeboxes. That's a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun. All right? And the ladies had a great time at our tea. We had a good time. That was awesome. 
It was set up so nice. If you didn't get to come, maybe we'll be able to do it again next year, and, and uh, we'll look for you to be here. All right, Larry Miller is the Focus family this week. Brother Larry comes in here on the weekends and cleans quite often and just willing to do for the house. Brother Larry has a call on his life. He is a blessing. He is a minister of the gospel, even if sometimes he doesn't know it. So we just stand together in, for every vic victory for Larry and that he is here among us. We just He's just an awesome fellow, and we appreciate him so much. All right, so remember him in your prayer. Stand up with me. Let's declare who we are and what God is doing with this house. We're a family church, a Bible training center. We're changing Lancaster, South Carolina, and we're excited about Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So our vision is Jesus Christ. Our mission is to preach, teach, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of his glory and power and to radiate his love to our community and to all the world. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. The power is in him. The authority is in him. The glory is in him. Whatever you need. Every need met in him. Praise God. All right. Take your um, tithes, your offerings, and your alms in your hands, please. We want to hold them up to the Lord and pray over them. We honor the Lord with our substance and with the first fruits of all of our increase so that our barns will be filled with plenty and our presses shall burst forth with new wine. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your supply. We thank you, Father, for increasing us with godly increase. Every family, every household, we thank you that we are growing. We are going forth to do your will in the earth. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in this place. Every need met, every provision, that you make us a blessing in Lancaster, South Carolina. And we thank you for it, Father. We thank you and we sow because we love you and we sow because you are our source. And we just connect ourselves to what you're doing in the earth as we sow and we give. And we thank you for increasing it, for the, its usefulness, and increasing the seed and the, having a great harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Love on somebody as you give.
Praise God. All right, just remain standing with me. God bless you. What a great day, and the house of the Lord is full, because you're the house and you're full of Him. And we are so thankful for His grace and His goodness. God's blessed us, and we're going forward. It's 32 days to conference. And we're extending an invitation of all of you who watch by internet or see the videos and to all of you here locally and extra locally to make plans now to set your heart to come. That's our Feast of Tabernacles. The natural people, their Feast of Tabernacles is ending in the next couple of days. And, uh, but ours never ends. We celebrate Tabernacles all year long. Amen. For I am the Tabernacle of God. He dwelleth in me. Whosoever shall confess Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him. And he dwelleth in God. First John 4, verse 15. I've got the holy word, the writ. And once it's in here, we're beyond controversy. The controversy's ended. If I confess he's the son of God, then he dwells in me and I in him. And we are one spirit with the Lord. So you are richly, deeply blessed as you prepare your heart. And we're going to work together and labor together. And the fall's always busy. Let's have the best fall we've ever had. And I'm believing God, man, it is fun to host a conference. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm asking God to help me shift my thought and to shift my heart. And I believe this year we'll have a better conference just because I'm going to have a better attitude. I never had, I didn't have a bad attitude, but it wasn't the best because I sure wasn't enjoying it. I was just thanking God we got through it, got over it. I love to have them, but not to host them. But now God's going to give me the love to host and to bless and to minister to people on a whole nother level. So praise God. It's just, it's amazing how often we operate outside the confines uh, of the pleasure of the Lord. What pleasures his heart is when I'm one with him and he has no dread of a conference. He loves it when we come together. He celebrates it. He enjoys it. And if that's his attitude, that ought to be my attitude. Amen. That ought to be your attitude. Praise God. A little better. Amen. Amen. Father, tonight in the name of Jesus, we give honor and glory to your Son. He is exalted, glorified. He reigns as Lord of all, Jesus, the Son of God. We believe on your name, and we love one another as you've given us commandment. We set our heart to obey and to flow with you. Thank you tonight for Benjamin's feast. Thank you that you lead us, guide us, instruct us, teach us. Our eyes, our ears, our heart are filled with revelation, wisdom, understanding, and supernatural knowledge that shifts and changes us, moving us from faith to faith and glory to glory. Thank you. Your word is sown on good ground. We embrace it wholeheartedly. And Father, we hide it deep in our heart tonight with your spirit and by your grace that it may bring forth fruit to your glory. We give you praise. Thank you for feeding us richly and royally at your table tonight teaching us the gospel and showing us your son in his magnificent glory. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen. All right, children, young people, you may go with your leaders and staff. And if you're in the auditorium, you can turn with me to Isaiah 48, verse 17 and 18. We're continuing our thoughts in the subject of God's rest the seventh day. And we are going to learn how to rest learning how to rest, learning how to let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let the peace of God rule in your heart, which you're also called in one body. Be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So sing tonight, make melody in your heart tonight, bless him tonight, and let's share his goodness and his glory tonight together at the table. I'm believing God for Benjamin's feast in the instruction of rest tonight. It's changing my life, shifting me, shifting my thought. And the word is evermore governing my conscience now and my confidence, my character, my conviction, my conversation, and my conduct. I'm learning to let this written word of the new covenant by the Spirit govern everything that I am. And the more it governs me, the more I'm realizing I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I'm blood washed. I'm redeemed. I'm reconciled, regenerated, made new by the Spirit of God, called with a holy calling, cleansed with a holy blood, standing tonight in a perfect righteousness through my Lord Jesus. And if you heard what the Lord said Sunday here in this house, 
how blessed we are. In those moments from Sunday until now, where I've missed it or fallen short, he has contradicted me and he is standing for me in perfect righteousness. And his righteousness is mine. His strength is mine. His grace is mine. And I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm rich. I'm beside myself. I'm blessed and highly favored. He is my Father. His Spirit crying, Abba, Father. My Spirit crying, Abba, Father. And the greatest unfolding of God that we can ever know is know Him as our Father. We call Him Abba. We call Him Father tonight. Your Father knoweth you have need of all these things. So let's open our heart to the good word of the Lord. We're studying the subject of flowing in the eighth day. And the Lord said to me, walk the people through the seven days of a new creation. And we're learning that from Genesis chapter 1. We are now in the seventh day. The seventh day is not marked by worship, as many argue, which day we should worship on. But the seventh day is marked by rest. And God confirmed the man by putting the man in his supernatural rest. The day is different for it has no beginning and it has no ending in Genesis 2, 1 through 4. The other six days of creation and the even and the morning and the even and the morning and the even and the morning. The day is different. It is a dimension of spirit. You must learn this about God. There are four realms in God. And that's not because God is fragmented or God is scattered. It's for our understanding. Now, thus far in my studies, I read a book by Dr. Cho who at one time had the largest church in the world. And he may still have. I haven't heard anything about him in a long time. But he wrote a book entitled The Fourth Dimension. And I read it when I first got saved. I didn't understand any of it. And I read it again after about 10 years. I understood a little bit of it. Now I've read it again recently. And I believe he saw these things, but he didn't know how to quite articulate that which he saw. I, I think in, in the writing of the book, there was, there was some things that could have been said. And perhaps he wrote in all the light he had. And you never fault anyone. He was seeing things back then nobody else was seeing. And we thank God for that. He was a pioneer before his time. But now when I read that book, I can see... There's saving grace, and there's sufficient grace, there's supernatural grace, and there's sovereign grace. That there is joy, there is great joy, there's exceeding great joy, and then there's joy unspeakable, full of glory, dimensions in God. And then there is peace, and great peace have they that love thy law. Peace that passes understanding. And then perfect peace or shalom, shalom, perfect peace that belongs to us. There is faith. There is little faith. There is so great faith in Israel. And then there is building yourselves up in the most holy faith, four realms of faith. So think here's peace. Here's love. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. That's one realm of faith, of love. And then comes for his great love wherewith he loved us. That's the second. And then the third is love that passes knowledge. In Ephesians 3, that Paul prayed, we would come to know the love of Christ, the height, the depth, the width, the breadth that passes knowledge. And then the fourth is perfect love. Same love, but it's in dimension so we can walk through and grow into all that God has for us. And even with God himself, even though he's very much one, there is the living God, there is the Lord, there is the Lord God Almighty, and then there is Father. And the seventh day is reserved for us to get to know the Father. Think of this. He never panics. He never sweats. He never struggles. He never strives. He never out of sorts. He's always in that perfect realm of rest. And he's called you there, quickened you, raised you, and made you to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. That's yours. You're seated with him in heavenly places. And as he is, 1 John 4, 17, we are in this world. So he put the man in a finished work in the old covenant in Adam and then had to make right decisions. And the decisions primarily we're based on the diet. You shall eat freely of every tree, but of the knowledge of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. 
And so here we are tonight. We're in a finished work and we're right back where Adam was in a sense. Although we're in a higher dimension and a higher place than Adam ever had. He was in the earth room. He was never seated in the heavenlies in Christ. You are. You are. God didn't take you to the Garden of Eden. He took you before the world began. There in Ephesians 1, 4, you were chosen in him that you would be holy and without blame before him in love. In Ephesians chapter 3, 9, this mystery was hidden in God, that God would show us the fellowship of his grace. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. In Revelation 13, 8, he was slain before the foundation of the world. God took you all the way back there. And in God's heart and mind, it's though you've been there all along, sons and daughters. The family. You're born of God, born into the family. He treasures you richly and royally. You are the apple of his eye. You are the passion of his pleasure. He loves you. And I know that because how much he loved Jesus. And he gave Jesus for you. He had to want you or he would have never given such a priceless treasure to redeem you as to give Jesus. He loved us with all of his heart, mind, strength, and soul, and gave Jesus to die our death and raise Jesus from the dead to bring us into life and to bring us under rest. Now, when we're studying rest, first, there's a personal invitation here to relationship. You rest through relationship. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest it's through relationship. Then secondly, it's the inheritance of your redemption when the trumpet sounds and the ram's horn blows in the realm of spirit or redemption is signaled to you and you begin to hear it's finished. For some of you, that was five years ago. Some of you, 10, but you begin to hear it is finished. The blood is on the mercy seat. The high priest has appeared a second time without sin unto salvation. You begin to hear that call. It's the high, the heavenly, the holy calling of God. Then you begin to enter into his rest at that moment. You can never rest until you know it's finished. And it is so finished that he who began a good work in you will perform it till the day. That means he'll never quit till he brings you to the full rest of what's been finished for you. He will never stop working. He will conform it and perform it till the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. How rich we are tonight. How good he is. We're thankful tonight. And then number three, there are infirmities in real life. And we know that this realm is in the fall. But we must stop dwelling in this realm. We must take our head out of this realm and our thought out of this realm and place our mind on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. And I encourage you again, we don't deny reality, we just defy it. We don't deny it, we just defy it. That's all we've learned to do. Praise God. We defy the realities that are around us. The sickness is not my lot. Trouble is not my lot. Death is not my lot. I'm redeemed and so are you. I'm free and so are you. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And you're free and you're blessed, redeemed of the Lord. And so although there are infirmities in real life, we don't deny, we just learn to defy. And God calls things that be not as though they were and that's what we're doing all the time. I'm calling myself healed because he calls me healed. And it don't matter what you call yourself, if he didn't call you first, you know, you're just calling to the wind. But if he calls you blessed and you agree with him, blessing starts working. If he calls you more than a conqueror and you start calling you more than a conqueror, it starts working. So I've set myself in agreement with my father. I and my father are one. We're in agreement together. And thank God again, even in those places when I miss it, Jesus is there on my behalf. I have so rejoiced in that word this week. I have so rested and so rejoiced in the glory of my high priest who is faithful, will not lie, cannot fail, and ever before the Father. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you don't confess me before, my, before men, I'll still confess you before the Father. I'll contradict you because I've set my heart in agreement with what I've done and who you are, and that's what I believe. Jesus doesn't move from his faith tonight. So we're redeemed. And then we're learning here now instruction and rest. So Isaiah 48, verse 17 and 18. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, which teaches you to profit, and lead you by the way that you should go. Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace. I want you to circle this tonight. Thy peace. Here he gives it to you freely. He gives it to you through Jesus. He gives it to you completely. This is your peace. This is your shalom. This is your wholeness, your blessing, your portion, your rest. It's your healing. Whatever you need tonight, he calls it yours. 
Whatever you need tonight, he calls it yours. That your peace, it comes from God, it comes from him. Your wholeness would have been like a river. It would flow like a river. And when your wholeness starts flowing like a river, the inevitable result of that is the supernatural starts overtaking this realm. Your body's being quickened. Your youth is being renewed. Your mind is being rested. Your heart is being strengthened. Your relationships are being nurtured. Your finances are being blessed. It's inevitable. The shalom of God flows like a river when you begin to walk in obedience. And then he tells you your righteousness. And here, just possess this. They which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Receive it tonight. This is my righteousness now. It's not his any longer. He gave it to me. It's always his, but it's mine. So we could say this and be right. Our righteousness is one. He has become my righteousness. And notice here, the Spirit of God writes to Isaiah, your righteousness would be like a wave and like waves of the sea coming in and moving and flowing according to the gravitational flow of the earth, which is largely determined by the moon which is the lesser light, which is a type of the law. And when the woman takes her place and the moon's under her feet, then the righteousness begins to flow like a wave. Because we know that righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us through Jesus. Perfect righteousness begins to be fulfilled in us and bring forth fruit unto his glory and unto his praise. So tonight, let's just look at what we've learned so far out of this text. Learning how to rest. It's foreign to the carnal mind. We don't know how to do this. Your carnal mind will fight you on this. Oftentimes it's the most unnatural way to live, but yet it's the way God wants you to live. You will never experience glory until you live the way God wants you to live. God never put the eagle in a cage. He didn't put the whale in a tank and he didn't put you in the flesh. He put you in the realm of spirit. He put man in glory. And when man stepped out of glory, he ceased to function the way God intended him to. Now I've heard this preached my, all my life in church. God wants to get you out of your comfort zone. And the truth of the reality of the revelation is God wants to get you in your comfort zone. The truth is, is that we've wallowed around and we have flopped and flopped like a fish out of water to where that's comfortable to people. They begin to be concerned. I'm a little concerned why things are going so good. That's not comfortable to people. I'm just waiting for the next shoe to fall. I'm waiting for whatever's coming to come. I know something's going to come. I know something's coming. It just can't stay like this. Nothing good ever lasts. Whoever said that didn't believe the gospel. This gospel lasts forever. Man, being high in the presence of God, being lifted up. Lord, lift us up where we belong. Seated with Him, reigning with Him, resting in Him, rejoicing in Him, learning Him, learning who He is, how He talks, how He walks, how He thinks, how He does it. There's nothing better than that. So when we start this instruction, number one, we learn it's based on his word. Thus saith the Lord. Based on his word, his word is his integrity. And once it's in the word, it's beyond controversy. Men can debate its meaning. And there are probably many levels of every scripture. But the reality of what God said is forever. He will not alter the thing that's gone out of his lips. Psalms 89, 34. I will not alter the thing that has come out of my lips. He will not change his mind. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in the heavens. Heaven and earth will pass away, but thy word shall never pass away. His word is forever. It is in the Holy Writ. That blood-sealed document of the new covenant is your guarantee, and Jesus guarantees that word. Hebrews 7, 22, Jesus is the surety, which means he's the guarantee of the new covenant. Everything God said is holy based on Jesus. That ought to make you shout tonight. Everything God said about you is not based on you. It don't rest on you. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on the Lord Jesus at the right hand of God in sovereign glory. That makes it easier to believe. Because if it depends on me, I already got my doubts. It doesn't depend on me. It depends on Him. So his word, integrity and assurance. And then number two tonight, you'll notice this, his witness. He says that I am the Lord. I am your redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. And I am your God. Gives you four revelations of who he is there. He is the Lord. He is your God. He is your strength. He is your redeemer. You're redeemed tonight. The Lord redeemed you. He paid the price. He died the death. He lives the life. He redeemed you. You're redeemed tonight. We rejoice in his redemption. 
And so there's a witness of who God is. This is not just anybody talking. This is the Almighty, the Sovereign, the ruling, reigning, monarch of the universe. He's talking to us here. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer, I am your God. Thank you, you're my God. He is my God. He's a mighty God and an awesome God, but He is my God. This is personal, to intimately know Jesus personally. So there's His witness. Then there's His wisdom. I will teach you to profit and lead you in the way that you should go. And no matter what state or situation you're in, the Lord knows how to profit. You can be in a mess and he can teach you how to walk right out of it. He can teach you how to walk out of sickness. He can teach you how to walk out of fear. He can teach you how to walk out of failure. He can teach you how to walk out of the flesh. He can teach you how to walk out of anything you need to walk out of. I will teach you to profit. You ought to take him up on the invitation. Because I've been in this class lately and I know I've got a good teacher. It's just I'm praying now, Lord, make me a good student. Because you're a good teacher. You're a good teacher. And the Lord can direct you in just a few simple steps and take you into a place where you begin to profit in the very place where you had once failed. How about this for God teaching a man to profit? Moses killed the one Egyptian, ran into the wilderness. Forty years later, he's given up all hope of deliverance. Everything his mother taught him seems as though it's never going to work. It was just a, a fable and a fairy tale from the time he was a child. Burning bush appears. And what does God do? Send him right back to the very place where he had miserably failed and he came out. He couldn't even deliver one Israelite that day. He went back and delivered two million. Now that's some profit there. That's some increase. God put a word in his mouth and he went before Pharaoh and in his own strength he couldn't deliver one Israelite in God's wisdom, in God's ability, in God's intelligence. He walked out of there with two million people following him. There's a two million to one ratio right there and that's old covenant. The Holy Ghost is in you to teach you and lead you and guide you. And teach you to profit. His wisdom is unsearchable. Isaiah said he took a grain of sand and weighed the mountains, the hills, and the valleys of the earth. Said he took a drop of water in his hand and he weighed the oceans. What kind of mind are we dealing with? That one grain of sand in his hand and he calculated everything the weight of the mountains had to be to keep the earth exactly right. He put the earth in space with his word. He upholds all things by the word of his power. It continually goes on its axis. It's orbiting the sun. It is moving. It is tilting. It is turning. It is exactly right. It is exactly the way it's supposed to be to sustain life. Your God is just completely awesome. Who has his mind? His ways are past finding out, but he will teach you. If you're willing to say, Lord, lead me, teach me, guide me here, help me, he will teach you. What do you want to know? Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, teach me to minister your word. Lord, teach me to minister healing to the sick. I've prayed that many times. Lord, teach me how to sow seed. Teach me how to believe your word. He'll teach you anything you need to know. He's your teacher. And he's a good teacher. The best teacher. Experience is not the best teacher. The Holy Ghost is the best teacher. And there's wisdom. And then last week we talked about a willingness for you to entreat the commandment of the Lord. And we found out it's not the ten and it's not the two, but it's the truth. I'm delivered from the ten of the stone and the two that Jesus fulfilled. And now tonight the truth is, this is His commandment. That we believe on the name of His Son Jesus and love one another as He gave us commandment. Walking in faith, walking in love, that fulfills the law. All things are open there. Walking in faith and walking in love. Every step out of love is going to lead to difficulty. Every step out of faith is going to lead to difficulty. Love and faith. And faith worketh by love. And it doesn't work by how much you love. It works by how much God loves you. If you want your faith increase, just let Father love you. Just let Father's love pour in. Let this perfect love cast out fear. And faith worketh by love. And I was taught that faith, my faith, would only work as I walked in love. But I found out that my faith works according to Father's love for me. And the more I know and believe the love God had toward me, the more that I'm able to walk in love. And then it makes faith a much easier thing. I'm no longer trying to get things. I now realize all things are already mine. I'm an heir of God and joined ever Christ. It's already done. It's finished. I'm, it's already mine. And so we begin to walk in faith and we walk in love. We believe God. We walk by faith and not by sight. Have faith in God. Our faith is quickened. God dealt to you the measure of faith. Now do something with it. Believe on the name of His Son. 
Make it your conscience and your deliberate decision to believe on the name of his son Jesus. Hear the Ten Commandments in the light of faith. Take the name of the Lord your God in faith. Take it. Don't take it in vain. Take the name of Jesus and believe. Take the name of Jesus and lay hands on the sick. Take the name of Jesus. Bless that name. Praise that name. Honor that name. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul prayed that the name of Jesus would be glorified in you and that you would be glorified in him. And Peter preaching before the Sanhedrin court said, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And Paul wrote, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, whether in heaven, earth, or under the earth, every tongue confess, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We believe on the name of Jesus tonight. Jesus is Lord. And then we learn to love one another. I'm not loving you as I love myself. I'm not loving you so you'll love me, but I'm loving you as Father loves me. I'm learning. A new commandment I give unto you that you love. And I am forgiving you already. You're forgiven. What are you going to do? You hadn't done a thing to me, but you're forgiven. I'm not going to wait till you do something to try and forgive you then. That creates struggle. You're forgiven. I'm reconciled to men. I'm reconciled. Before I ever came over here, I'm reconciled. And when you live there, it's amazing how much love can flourish and you stop struggling with your enemies. And now I can begin to just lift my hands and say, thank you, Lord, that the sins of my enemies are not laid to their charge. I thank you that they are free, will reap no consequences from what they're doing against me. But I bless my enemies. Do it with a right heart. Do it in full assurance of faith. And do it and let God deal with them and just thank God that because of intercession, they are free. And bless them. That's walking in love used to take me six months to get over it. And then it took me six weeks. I got down to six days. I gotten down to six hours. Get down to six minutes. Get down to six seconds. And get to a place where you don't have to get over it anymore because you're already over it before it starts. The best way to deal with a fire is not to have one. Far better not to have a fire than to have one have to put it out. Damage is always done. Bitterness, not for you. Anger, jealousy, wrath, malice, ill will, bitterness, none of that belongs to you. Paul prayed in Philippians 1 that you would be free from offense and sincere until the day of Jesus Christ. Just imagine that. Free from offense. Living without offense. Not offended in any man. Blessing even your adversaries and your enemies. Blessing them because he's blessing you. Not because they deserve it. Not because that they don't need to be dealt with, but because Father blesses you, you're blessing them. Because Father forgives you, you've forgiven them. And see, here's the thing. God didn't wait till you messed up to forgive you. He forgave you before the foundation of the world when the Lamb was slain. He's proactive. And if we start living the way he does, then we'll become proactive and the shield of faith will be up and we'll be walking in faith and love. That is his commandment. So you know what he says? Oh, that you would open door. Would hearken to my commandment. Walk in love and walk in faith. Believe the name of my son and love one another. Some supernatural things are on the horizon when you hearken to his commandment and his commandments are not grievous unto you. His commandments are not grievous. This is not a harsh thing. This is not a hard thing to me. It's becoming easier because of him. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now tonight, let's look to this last thought, our wealth in Christ. What happens when we begin to walk in faith and love, our faith in the name of Jesus, loving one another as he gave command, learning to love his way, walking free from offense? Then he says, now we're rejoicing tonight because he said, this is his word. He said, your peace will flow like a river. Your wholeness, your shalom, your entirety, the word shalom, safety, peace, health, prosperity, favor, abundance will flow like a river and your righteousness, your right standing with God, your salvation will begin to flourish like the waves of the sea coming in continually and with consistency. And there's so much here that we could talk about. The inheritance that's ours, the wealth that is ours. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. All things are ours, 1 Corinthians 3.21. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, Luke 12.32. Colossians 2.10, you are complete in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 6.17, he gives you richly all things to enjoy. 
Romans 8, 32, How shall he not also with Christ freely give us all things? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask him, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We are richly blessed tonight. And now it's time for our inheritance to unfold and unveil Jesus and begin to work on an unprecedented level where we're concerned. There's a bag with a hole in it. There's a barrel that does not run dry. There's a basket full and a barn full. And that's true not only financially, but it'd be true in every dimension, spiritually, mentally, physically, socially, financially. So we're going to learn here tonight how some things flow. Number one, let's get this tonight. Number one, the scriptural foundation for believing, it does matter what you believe here. Now, John 7, 37, 38. John 7, verse 37 and 38. The last day of the feast, the great notable day, Jesus stood and cried with a loud voice, said, If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me. And then he said, He that believeth on me as the Scripture has said. He that believeth on me as the Scripture has said, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So we have to start with what Jesus said here. Out of his belly shall flow. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said. The scriptural foundation. Now here's what we were taught. The flow of fasting and prayer and all the things that we can do will increase the flow. Were you taught that? I was taught that. Fasting, prayer, all these things that we can do increase the flow. This is my experience. The more that I would fast and pray to have the flow, God set a trap there. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. There's a trap there, and it's a good trap. And when God traps you, He only wants to bless you. He never traps you to hurt you or wound you or destroy you. If He was going to do that, He wouldn't put Jesus on the cross. But when God corners you, it's only to bless you. So here was my experience. I remember in my first church, we had a little cripple boy named Randy there. And uh, I went seven days before I would lay hands on Randy. I went seven days fasting and praying. Because in my mind, I was convinced if I'd fast and pray seven days, that I could lay hands on Randy and the Lord would heal him. And I laid hands on Randy after seven days and praise God, Randy got some healing in his body. Thank God for that. Now, I, don't, I want to be fair. He wasn't completely healed, but he did receive and he was able to walk, which he hadn't been able to walk before. Some good things happened. So then the next time I ran across a case like that, I fasted and prayed seven days. And you know what happened? Not nearly as much happened the second time as it did the first. And so then what I did with the sin consciousness, I began to examine me. What's wrong? And my determination was, next time I'll fast 10 days. And that didn't really increase the flow. So then I went to 14 and I got up to 21. And when I got to 21, I began to see some more things. And thinking, praise God, here's how you have a great flow. You want a healing anointing, you fast 21 days. Well, the problem was, after we had a few miracles and some things shifted after 21 days, things shifted right back again, and pretty soon, now, I did 21 days the second time, I'm talking about nothing but liquids. 21 days, that's a long time. It takes diligence to do that. It took turning off the TV to do that. It took putting my face in my Bible to do that. And I thank God for the grace to do that, but I learned some things that are much more valuable than fastings and prayer. I learned that every time you go there and God grants you that reward of the diligent, then the next time you got to do more to get more. Now I realize this is going against a lot of the teaching that's out there, because if we would just fast and pray, we can have revival. The truth is, Jesus said, He that believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow. So it doesn't matter whether you ate lunch 30 minutes ago. That's not the issue. The issue is believing on Him. And when I started believing on Him and believing that by believing on Him, the river would flow, praise God, I started having some flow that increased, revelation increased, rejoicing increased, the favor of God increased, the blessing increased, and it wasn't based on me doing more. It was based on believing Him. 
I believe Jesus was in the beginning with the Word and was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. I believe He came through the womb of the Virgin Mary. I believe He lived a sinless life had no sin, knew no sin, did no sin. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years came and showed us the Father. I believe He declared and demonstrated the kingdom of God. Tell John the Baptist, the blind see and the deaf hear and the cripples walk and the lepers are cleansed and the dead are raised. Tell him the kingdom of God has come. Tell him that. Jesus demonstrated and declared unto us the kingdom of God. I believe Jesus went in the garden of Gethsemane, laid His life down and took up my death, laid his peace down and took up my fear, laid his righteousness down and took up my sin I believe he went into that garden and laid everything he was down and took up everything I was, he went to an old rugged cross he bled, he died, he suffered, he was wounded for my transgression he was bruised for my iniquity the chastisement of my peace was upon him with his stripes were healed, he was afflicted, he was oppressed, he was made sin, he was made sick with our disease for three days and three nights he took the ride of Jonah in the belly of the whale because of my disobedience. But after three days, I believe Jesus was raised from the dead in omnipotent, sovereign victory and glory. Jesus risen. Jesus is alive. And He showed Himself alive by many infallible proofs. I believe Jesus is alive. And I believe He showed Himself alive 40 days by many infallible proofs. He ascended on high. He gave His name. He gave His Spirit. He breathed into them. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, This Jesus, whom you crucified, God hath raised up and made Him both Lord and Christ. He is exalted. He is reigning. And tonight, seated in majestic glory at the right hand of God, Jesus is prophet. He is priest. He is King of the New Covenant, Head of the Body, preeminent in all things. He is Lord of all. It matters what you believe about Jesus. And if you believe that about Jesus, the river will start flowing. And then if you want to fast and pray, it will become a pleasure to you. If you want to fast and pray, it will become a delight to you rather than you trying to get something, trying to move God or manipulate God. Now, thank God, my prayer time, if I miss a meal or I lay a meal down or two or go a day and fast, it's no longer the burden of trying to get. It's the blessing of flowing with Him. I'd just rather talk to you than eat my food. Job said it this way, I've esteemed your word more than my necessary food. There are some times I've been in here and if it had not been for just wanting to please Teresa and get home on time because if she fixes supper, it'd be very rude not to show up. I would have rather stayed here and talked to him and been with him. I was in the glory. I was in the fellowship. Food was not what my, I, my, my belly ain't my, my belly ain't my God anymore. Praise God. I'm not moved by that. But oh, when you get in the river, it flows. He that believeth on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So just talk like that. I believe Jesus is my strength. I believe Jesus is my salvation. I believe Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my banker. Jesus is my healer and my physician. Jesus is my marriage counselor. Jesus is my blessing. Jesus is my portion. And the more I believe Him and believe on Him and look to Him and Him alone, the more the river starts to flow. And when the river flows, things move from one dimension to another. They move from the natural to the supernatural. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord God Almighty, by my spirit, it begins to flow out of believing on Him. It's not just believing the Bible. Believing the Bible is a good thing. But in the volume of the book, it's written of me, Hebrews 10, 7. In the volume of the book, when Jesus was raised from the dead and they were walking on the road to Emmaus, Jesus started at Moses in the writings of the Pentateuch in Genesis and He expounded all through the Old Covenant the things concerning Himself, Jesus raised from the dead, shielded their eyes. Jesus raised from the dead, withheld their understanding to know who He was so He could show them who He was in the Bible. Which tells me this, it's more important that you get a revelation of Jesus from the Word than that you see Him in person. I went to a meeting where a man had fasted 40 days. He'd actually fasted 47 days. And it was just after his fast. This guy looked like a, a mop with an afro. He had, had big, thick, curly hair. He, he, he was, I mean, you, I believed it. Now, some people tell me they've been fasting 40 days. I don't believe it. When I looked at him, I believed it. He looked like he was about 30 minutes away from starving to death. I believed it. 
And he was a little guy, a little stick of a guy. And he said, the Lord Jesus, and the reason I fasted, as he preached to us that night, the reason I fasted, I wanted to see Jesus for myself. And according to his testimony, the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And I don't doubt the man that he did. But what was so tragic about that, the Lord Jesus appeared to him, and everything that that man preached that night, I could have got out of the book of Ephesians. Forty-seven days without food till he nearly starved himself to death, or he could have got on his knees and opened the book of Ephesians and said, give me a revelation of Jesus. Let me see you in your word. You need to believe on Jesus tonight. Jesus is your strength. He's your healing. Put your trust, faith, and confidence in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptural foundation. And what was God's commandment? Believe on the name of my son, Jesus. Now think of that, a man fasting 47 days. And I believe it because he was, he was emaciated. His face was sunken. His eyes were sunken. His suit was hanging. He looked like he had been without food for a long, long time. Looked like he'd been on a hunger strike. But everything he preached was out of the book of Ephesians. Everything Jesus said to him was out of the book of Ephesians. You can get on your knees and thank God, believe on Jesus and see what he'll reveal to you. He'll teach you and show you. He'll reveal himself to you. He'll preach to you. He'll show you himself. That's my cry. Show me the Lord Jesus. And then once I begin to see Jesus, Jesus, show me the Father. For Jesus said, the Father reveals the Son to whom he will. And the Son reveals the Father also to whom he will. Jesus, show me the Father. Father, show me the Son. And Spirit of God, let me see clearly, accurately, according to your word. It's amazing how that increases the flow. Now notice in our text tonight, our wealth begins with believing on Jesus. But notice this, then he says that your peace or your shalom is going to flow like a river. And Jesus connected that river coming out of your belly. You're the garden now. He's put the garden in you and you in the garden. Eden is the pleasure of God. It's Christ in you. Eden is the pleasure of God, Christ in you, you in Christ. And now out of your belly or from within you is flowing a river of living water. Genesis chapter 2, verse 11 through verses 15. From the garden flows a river divided into four parts, four stages again. Here it is, the river flowing, Pison, Gion, Hadikel, and Euphrates. Pison, increase. Increase. Gion, a breaking forth. Heidi Kell, swift without time or supernaturally. And then Euphrates, fruitfulness. And when you put that thought together, this is what you see. That as the river flows, how does it flow? It flows by believing on Jesus. If you want more flow, believe on Jesus. The more you believe on him, the more the river flows. The more you work to get it to flow, the less it's going to flow. Pretty soon you'll be fasting 30 days to get very little. You may get some people healed that way. But sooner or later, God keeps saying, if you want more, do more. And there comes a place. And what he's doing there is drawing you to the place where you say, I can't fast anymore. I can't pray another prayer. I can't cry another tear over my unsaved loved ones. I can't. I don't have any more tears. My eyes have ran like a river. I can't cry over these boys anymore. I can't cry over my husband or wife. I can't do it anymore. And then God says, you ready? Ready? You come to the end of yourself? You ready? Are you ready? I'm glad you came. Now most people never get that far. Somehow most people still believe they somehow can do it. Most people never get that far. I complained bitterly bitterly to the Lord several months ago. And I said, it took me too long to get here. He said, no, you got here fast. And I said, how you figure that? He said, most men never get here at all. He said, at least you're here. Now where we go from here is going to determine how you yield to me. Because I've already set my course. There's an adventure plan for you and me. We're going to do some things that are incredible. He told me, you and me together, we're going to do some things that are going to shake the earth if you'll come with me. All you got to do is come with me. But but most people never get to where you've gotten. Oh, I'm praising God tonight. And I start believing on Him and increase starts coming. Increase starts flowing. And it starts breaking forth. And it starts supernaturally happening to bring forth a fruitfulness. There's going to come a time when we move in this church and one Sunday we're one size, the next Sunday we're a whole different size. We're looking around and saying, where in the world all these people come from? 
supernatural. Supernatural. Just above and beyond what you can ask or think according to that power that's working in you. It's the power of faith in the Lord Jesus ministry manifesting this river flowing. And it's something to walk in. It's something to worship in. You bow your knees in it. And then it's something to witness in. You cover your loins and you make yourself a eunuch. For the kingdom of God, I have no seed. I have no name, nothing to give, nothing to sow. It's all of Christ. It's Him. It's all of Christ. And then it becomes a wisdom or a river that cannot be passed over. And it breaks forth. And the flow brings amazing and supernatural increase in our life. Rest, relationship, revelation, rejoicing. All of it begins to increase. And it breaks forth, and I love this. Jesus said, pour the water into the stone pots at the wedding. Pour the water into the stone. Life is water. The stone you could preach is the law or the hearts of men that have been hardened by the law. Several ways you could preach that. And then Jesus, in a moment, turned the water into wine. He superseded time there. What would have taken about 40 years from the seed going in the ground to produce the best wine in the vineyard, he turned 40 years into a millisecond. 40 years. And then he said something. I'd missed it till yesterday. I was reading again. And Jesus said to the servants, he said, draw out now. 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 And I'm telling you, it's time to draw out of you now. It's time to draw out from within you now. He's turned the water into wine. You may have had an old hard heart. He put his spirit in you, but he's done a work in you now. He's turned water into wine. And what was just giving you life has now been filled with color. It's been filled with taste. It is intoxicating. It is the best wine. It has been saved for now. Start drawing out of you now. There's something with out of your belly. You're going to have a river of wine flowing. Draw now and give to those at the feast. And this thing that's in me now is becoming intoxicating. It's becoming more radical. I, I'm being shifted. I'm being changed. I, I'm laughing. I'm smiling again. My, my eyes are sparkling again. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm realizing, hey, praise God, I look younger than I did yesterday. I feel stronger than I did yesterday. Go to the gym. Praise God, I'm stronger than I was a year ago. Something's happening. It's radically shifted me. Heidi Kale is breaking forth supernaturally. He's turning time into truth and taking you into a realm where truth prevails and when truth prevails then thank God all things are possible when the truth is prevailing over you it's radical it's radical your peace will flow like a river get in the flow it's hard get in the flow get in the flow now just think about your motor you know all of you got nice vehicles out there thank God for your vehicles thank God for good vehicles thank God for them and you know, you, you got you got some gas in the tank and some oil in the pan out there. And I promise you, in the realm of spirit, and I'm not being disrespectful, you got some you got some gas in the tank, you got some oil in the pan, you're full of the Holy Ghost, you got some. Smith Wigglesworth said, No man that's born again filled with the Holy Ghost knows what he has. No man. You got more than you think you do. You're full of the Holy Ghost. You're full of the power that raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. You're full of the glory of His name. You're full of the presence of the Father. You're full of the anointing. You're full of the power. The gifts of the Spirit are in you. The anointing's in you. The life of God's in you. You are a treasure in the earthen vessel. This treasure is housed in you. You have some oil and gas in you. But if it don't flow, you're going to be calling me or somebody here to come help you get home because you ain't going to get home. If that gas don't flow and that oil don't flow, you ain't going to make it home. Are you listening? If that oil don't flow, then your motor will burn up. You burn up and burn out. How many people we see burn up? And if that gas don't flow, there's no combustion. There is no, there's no spark. There's no fire. Oh, I want to, I, I don't want to live in the smoke of somebody else's fire. I, I do not want to live that way. I, I don't want to live in the light of what some other preacher is saying or what some other ministry is doing. But oh, to live in the burning. He maketh His ministers a flame of fire and tongues of fire set on each of them. Holy fire burning. A holy river flowing. Something moving. Something in me that just won't let me stay like I am. Holy fire. Holy passion. Holy power. Holy under the Lord. Believing. Working ministry. And it flowing like a river when that oil 
and gas flow in your car, you got something in your hands. You can move. You can go forward. You can transition. You can go from place to place. You can move freely when you have got the oil and the gas flowing. How does it flow, Pastor John? He that believeth on me. As the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Praise God. You're blessed tonight. You've got more in you than you realize. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellent power may be of God and not of us. Hmm. Praise God. And then thirdly tonight, it's very important, our Savior's fullness and the full benefit of what's ours in Him. Now, I looked up Psalms 103 this afternoon. I was doing some study. And forget not all his benefits. Thank God for benefits. Benefits are important. They enhance a job greatly. If you have a job with benefits, that those benefits can be an amazing blessing to you. But the word benefit here in the Hebrew language in Psalms 103 means the full dealing of God. The full dealing of God. God having fully dealt with you. It's an extraction of his dealings in death and his dealings in life. It's him having put me away, crucified, died, buried, quick and raised and seated me with him. It's not only the benefit of all that I have now, but all he took from me. Being freed from the power and the pride and the passion of sin, being freed from it. Made servants unto God, made sons and daughters unto God. It is the benefit, the full dealing of God. And when God raised Jesus from the dead, he made Jesus heir of all things, Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4. And then he made you an heir of God with Christ, Romans eight seventeen. And you're dead, that's your old life, and you are hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3.3. 3, and verse 4, Christ is our life, shall appear, you will appear with him in glory. And when he begins to appear, he begins to increase, he begins to take the preeminence and the precedence in your life, then you start appearing with him. It is impossible that he should appear and you not appear. Your appearing is in him, of him, by him, through him, with him. And without him, there can be no appearing of who you really are in Christ. It'll never happen. It's with him, of him, by him, through him, in him. So now all this is already yours. Your shalom, your peace, includes every benefit spiritually. So I'm just going to walk you through this here in our last 10 minutes. Ephesians 1, 3, spiritually, that's the only one you need to know. There are many, but this is the one that gives all precedent for spiritual blessing. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Praise God. All spiritual blessings. There's not one spiritual blessing he withheld from you. All spiritual blessings belong to you. Now think about how incredibly rich you are spiritually. They're all yours. This is your shalom. And all spiritual blessing include fruit and gift. In fruit, include flow, favor, freedom, fellowship with the Father, oneness in the Spirit. It would just, it would take forever to expound that in its fullest intent. He just blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's yours. So you appropriate that and you thank God. Fathers, I believe on the name of your son Jesus and I walk in love as you teach me. I thank you. There's a river of all spiritual blessings flowing. It's flowing in me. It's flowing to me. It's flowing through me. It's flowing over me. I am in the flow of every spiritual blessing. And you begin to take on the mindset that all things are yours. You're not trying to get your half. Praise God. Rich. Rich. In the mental realm, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. I'm stunned. We have the mind of Christ. We're not trying to get it. We're not praying for it. He said we have it. We have it. 
So that means then my mind, my mental capabilities, my intelligence, my soul realm, my mind, will, emotion, personality, intellect, conscience, and imagination, those seven aspects of my soul, are operating in and with a conjunction of the mind of Christ. That's incredible. That enlightens the intellect. It increases the intelligence. It brings forth wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. It brings forth peace in the soul realm. And you have the mind of Christ. Please hear this tonight. And I know you've heard it. It's a well-worn phrase here. God only has one thought about any one thing in your life at any one moment. God's not nearly as complicated where you're concerned as you've made him out to be. He's not trying to figure out which way you should go. He's not wondering what you should do. He's not searching the path you should go. He's got one thought. To operate in the mind of Christ is to operate in that one thought. God did not give you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Sound mind is me operating in the thought that God has toward me. Regardless of situations, I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord. Because Glenn Hunter is such a unique individual, there'll never be another Glenn before or after just like him. In his family line, many like him, but none just like him. Then God has some thoughts that are unique to Glenn Hunter that he'll never have about anybody before or after. They're only for him. And those can only be revealed through intimacy. God has some thoughts about you. He never had about anybody else. He'll never have about anybody else. You are uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully made. You're his. And he's got thoughts like that about everybody that's ever been conceived in the womb. So that on that level, his mind is unprecedented, and we're not going to be able to touch that level. But when it comes to me and my understanding, through intimacy with him, I begin to draw from that thought. I begin to draw from his thought. And as I do, it eliminates the duality. It eliminates the double-mindedness, which makes me unstable. And when you have the mind of Christ in operation, the end result will be peace or shalom flowing. It comes from a thought. You're only one thought away from God's thought. And all it takes is for you to repent and acknowledge the truth. So whatever you're struggling with tonight, whatever it is, takes one thought. Take your thought, whatever it is, Repent of it, lay it down. Father, what's your thought about this in my life? And through intimacy, he'll give you his thought. When you take that thought, you receive it. Thank you. The mind of Christ is operating in me. I thank you. I have your thought and I praise you and thank you that I am strengthened in your thought. Let it be my only thought and God will work by the Spirit to bring that to pass in your life. When I lay in a hospital bed for those three months, either at home in a sick bed or up there in a sick bed. I had report after report after report. And pancreatitis is serious. It's mid-grade serious. It's serious. Acute pancreatitis is much more serious because then your pancreas can't recover. And then necrotizing acute pancreatitis is often fatal. And my diagnosis was acute necrotizing pancreatitis. That was my diagnosis. It's on the medical report. That's what they determined that was wrong with me. And the thoughts there were many. There was often a thought of, are we going to have to put in an insulin pump? Are we going to have to put you on digestive enzymes from prescriptions so you can digest food? Because without your pancreas, you can't digest food. What about the issue now with the digestive system as a whole? It's been greatly compromised. Your immune system, much of it rests in your digestive tract. So now they're looking at the potential for a compromised immune system as well as a digestive issue, as well as a pancreas issue. Lots of thoughts. 
And these were good people. These were good doctors. These were men and women who were skilled and schooled, who went to school, studied long, hard, get up early, stay up late, work hard trying to help people. And they're not trying to hurt me. They're doing everything they can. They, they are looking through all of their thoughts to help me. But in the midst of that, listening to that day after day after day, listening to that, the Lord kept saying to me, I've got one thought. It's Numbers 21. You start about verse 7 and go down through verse 10. Everyone that looketh shall live. And the word live there is be made whole, restored to life, or be free from the serpent's bite. And I can't tell you that I got here in 10 minutes. Can't tell you I got here in 10 hours or 10 days, even 10 weeks. But I kept coming. The thoughts would come, I'd repent. I'd come back to God's thought. The thoughts would come, I'd listen. After the doctors would leave, you would always have an incredible battle with fear. The doctor, the surgeon, a skilled surgeon in his early 60s stood at my bed and said, your pancreas died this morning. We're going to take it out. That was his exact word to me. That was his exact word. That was his thought. That's not God's thought. And as I repented, as I came, thank God, I just rejoice. And I realize I've told you several times, but it means a lot to me that tonight that God's thoughts working in my mind and his thought is by whose stripes you're healed. And what I love about him is while I'm laying in that bed with all that swirling around me, he's there and he never changed his mind. He contradicted everything they said. And he said, Father, my son John is healed. John is healed. My stripes, Father, these stripes on my back, they healed John's body. John is healed. John will live his days in strength. He'll fulfill his days on the earth. He'll walk in everything that I have given him. John is healed. And he never changed his mind. And that's the mind you have access to. The mind that doesn't turn. The mind that doesn't change. The mind that doesn't flinch. The mind that doesn't fear. That's your mind. It's your, your mind. Your peace will flow like a river. powerful physically in the realm of the body the outward man perishes day by day but the inward man is renewed day by day now if we take that that leaves us with a living spirit and a dying body that leaves you to go the way of the world that leaves you to go the way everybody else is going but you gentlemen are sons of Abraham by faith. And you ladies are daughters of Sarah by faith. And when there's a controversy between two men, and we have a controversy, it's official. I have a spirit that's renewed. I have a body that is perishing, according to 2 Corinthians 4.16. If you'll go to Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 4, when there's a controversy between two men, they both shall be brought into judgment. And the righteous shall be declared free and the guilty shall be beaten and shall be striped with 40 save one, which means 39 stripes. One for each book of the Old Covenant. God set precedent there to put those stripes on Jesus to heal the Jews. And then the other stripes by the Romans went on his back to heal you. And in the Old Covenant, the righteous was justified and the wicked condemned. In the New Covenant, the righteous was condemned and the wicked was justified. In the old covenant, the wicked got beat. In the new covenant, the righteous got beat. And the blood that flowed from a righteous man was to settle the controversy. In Deuteronomy 25, God told them, and this shall settle the controversy. And then he says, you are not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. This is the word spoken by the judges, and you're not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. You're not to muzzle this word. The stripes satisfy the controversy. So tonight, your shalom starts flowing. Come on with me. Five more minutes. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He satisfies my mouth with good things so my youth is renewed like the eagles. Strong and blessed and healed, praise God. By His stripes are healed, quickened by the power of God, moving in the life of God. Shalom starts flowing. 
He said, your peace would flow like a river. Imagine healing flowing like a river. Come on, shout tonight. You know there's more healing than there is sickness. There's more life than there is death. There's more blessing than curse. There's more favor than disfavor. We're blessed tonight. My peace is flowing like a river. In the social arena, reconciliation is the blessing there. Shalom lives in the wholeness of relationship. See, God reconciled the world to himself. God did not impute their sin against them, 2 Corinthians 5.19. God imputed the world's sin to Christ. God imputed the world's sin to Christ. God imputed the world's sin to Christ. Boy, you're hard-pressed to find a preacher that believes that. We're still trying to get God to punish everybody for their sin, not realizing He punished sin in Christ. He punished sin in Christ. You can read it in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To wit, King James said, which means, boy, you need to know this. This is wisdom, to wit. To wit. God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. So God didn't hold anything against me. When I came to him, he freely gave me the gift of his son. Just like he did you freely, did he not? Because he'd already forgiven you in Christ. And once you receive Jesus and then you're trained and, and love fills your heart and you begin to operate in the love of God, then you operate just like he does. That starts flowing. Now this is the hardest arena. This was the hardest arena for me. It's tough. If you do it the way we used to do it, it's hard. But this way is God's way. It's shalom flowing like a river. We've already set ourselves in agreement. Set ourselves in agreement. I'm in agreement with God. The world's reconciled. Now just think about all the Christians that got tore up from the floor up when they passed the rights on gay marriage. Now am I for gay marriage? No, no, no. But I tell you this, God's reconciled the world to himself. Amen. Somebody said, we're not living in a Christian nation. I got a word for you. Jesus never lived in a Christian nation. He lived under Roman rule. Paul didn't live in a Christian nation. And that was never the criteria for the gospel. The gospel cannot be stopped. We're going to have to realize God's bigger than what men do. Somebody help me tonight. He's bigger than what men do. They can pass their laws. They can, they can even thumb their nose at Him. He's bigger than what men do. And He does not base His kingdom on what men do. He is sovereign in Himself. He's made His mind. He's set His heart. And He has forgiven the world and offers them opportunity to come. He has redeemed and blessed us through reconciliation. And all men need to do is receive the gift. Righteousness, according to the book of Romans, has come on every man. Every man's not made righteous yet, but it's come on every man. And when we get the mentality of reconciliation, praise God, we stop being angry with people. I'm thankful I'm not an angry preacher anymore. I'm thankful I have released, I have given and forgiven. I'm, I'm free. Praise God. So good to be free tonight. And financially, you have the resources of the earth. They're yours. Everywhere Abraham went, they blessed him with silver and gold and cattle. And you and I are to be saying, thank God the earth is mine. And the gold and the silver and the cattle, mine. How come? It's his. It's his. If it's his, it's mine because we're together. And shalom starts flowing. I notice when God puts me at rest in my finances, they do much better than when I fret. When I fret about finances, which it's a male thing, it's a male thing, and I got it honestly from my natural father, I did. My dad, that boy, you talk about a strict one for handling his money just the way he thought it ought to be handled. That man was strict about handling his money. First church I pastored, he sat down with me, little desk. We sat down together. He looked over the books. He almost cried. And he looked at me and I had 
three mortgages on this little parsonage and little church building and two lots, four lots, church on one lot, back lot, parking lot, parsonage. Four lots, three mortgages, a lot, a mortgage on the two lots, a mortgage on the church, a mortgage on the house. Two behind, two behind, two behind, six behind. Ready to get set out in the street when I took that church. And he looked at me, and of course all three of the mortgages together wasn't but four hundred dollars, so it's only twenty four hundred dollars. Which you look back at that, that was a, back then, that was a dump truckload of money back then. In the, in that place, because I didn't think there was that much money in that county. <laughs> I didn't think there's that much money in the county. Are you listening? <laughs> And he sat with me and he said, do uh, you want me to help you? And just out of, out of his kindness and love for me and love for the church that I had now taken, he said, I'll go ahead and I'll just give you $2,500 and you can put it on my, my giving record and I'll just, we'll get this called up and you can start afresh. I said, no, daddy, can't do that. I got to learn to do this God's way. And he looked at me and I said, dad, birds have bills, but they keep singing. He didn't think it was funny. He looked at me and said, that ain't funny. I said, well, yeah, it is. <laughs> I said, birds have bills, but they keep singing. I said, I'm just going to sing and praise the Lord. I learned something a long time ago. You can just learn to rest. The river will flow. And when the riches of shalom start flowing, the inevitable result will be things start increasing. Things start going the way they're supposed to. The flow of the Spirit, the move of the anointing, and the blessing of the Lord starts increasing. Stand with me. I think I've just about preached you into a coma tonight. Didn't get to righteousness. But we're blessed tonight. You're blessed tonight. Praise God. Benefits. God's full dealing with me. He had dealt with me. Praise you, Father. You've not dealt with me after my sin. You dealt with me according to your grace and mercy. You have put my sins in Christ. You have put my sins in Christ and put them to death on the tree and given me your righteousness. I thank you and I praise you for your blessing tonight. Now hear the word of the Lord. Oh, that you'd hearken to my commandment. Believe on the name of his son, Jesus. Love one another as he gave commandment. Then your shalom. Now I want you to get this as you're leaving tonight. My shalom. Make it personal. My shalom. My peace, my wholeness, my, that word means my safety, my prosperity, my favor, my blessing, my increase, my anointing, my strength, all that he has given, my shalom will flow like a river. And the river is Pison, Gion, Hidekel, and Euphrates. It is an increase and breaking forth of supernatural fruitfulness belongs to you and right now i pray father that you will cause this to come into manifestation over every person that's in this auditorium right now and over every person that watches or is watching and hears this that the supernatural increase of the breaking forth of your river and we draw out now and out of our belly flows rivers of living water it will flow now it begins to come on us in manifestation and i thank you and praise you increases upon our life we increase with the increase of God and I thank you and I praise you and I bless you that the river of Shalom is flowing and our righteousness is like a wave of the sea manifesting just continually manifesting and just coming in the earth and manifesting in the earth and we give you praise and honor we give you glory for it the mind of Christ we give you glory for the healing of our body the blessings that you have given spiritually they're all ours we rejoice tonight we give you praise and honor and we thank you and praise you in Jesus name in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we all said together, amen, amen, and amen. You know, you're blessed tonight. This altar's open. If you need prayer or you want to talk, God bless you. If you have thoughts that aren't the Lord's, lay them down. Take up his thought and see the river flow. God bless you in Jesus' name.